Welcome to all United States Sarans, friends of Sarah, and Sarans from around the world. This is our 36th meeting of Sarah Meets. Our first meeting aired three years ago on December 12th, 2020. I will be your host. I am Mike Downey, president of the U.S. Sarah Council and a member of the St. Sarah Club of Des Moines, Iowa. I'll officially call this meeting to order in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh God who wills not the death of a sinner, but rather that he be converted and saved and live, grant we beseech you through the intercession of the Blessed Mary ever Virgin, St. Joseph, her spouse, St. Junipero Sarah, and all the saints, an increase of laborers for your church, fellow laborers in Christ to spend and consume themselves for souls through the same Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you, and the, the unity of the Holy of the Spirit, Holy Spirit God, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As many of you know, this meeting is being recorded and can be accessed on the Sarah YouTube channel. And a link to the meeting will be published on the sarahus.org website. I know many clubs view this live as part of a club meeting. Others use the recording as part of their meeting held at other times. This meeting will be about one hour and will take the form of a typical Sarah Club meeting with an opening prayer, speaker, a business portion, and a closing prayer. We do expect to have plenty of time for questions and answers following the keynote presentation, so use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen for questions or comments. Our keynote speaker today is well known to U.S. Sarans. Bishop Thomas Daly is Episcopal Advisor to our U.S. Sarah Council. Bishop Daly was born in San Francisco. He earned a bachelor's degree from the University of San Francisco in 1982. A Master of Divinity from St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, California in 1987. And a Master of Education degree from Boston College in 1996. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of San Francisco in 1987. Pope Benedict XVI named him Auxiliary Bishop of the Diocese of San Jose on March 16, 2011. He was ordained on May 25, 2011. Pope Francis named him the seventh bishop of Spokane, Washington in 2015. He also currently serves as the chairman of the USCCB Committee of Catholic Education. Bishop Daly will be leading us in a reflection to prepare us for Advent this year. Bishop Daly, welcome to Sarah Meets. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, work with Sarans. I feel it is a tremendous grace that I um, are, am the Episcopal Advisor. I look forward to um, doing more with Sarah uh, as I conclude my last year as chair of the Bishop's Committee on Catholic Education, which is uh, a, a great privilege also, but one that uh, takes quite a bit of time. I thought for the reflections today, um, I would give um, basically four very brief um, comments, uh, expanded reflections on four themes that are important to us in this season of Advent. I begin with, with being very clear that um, I really love Advent for various reasons, um, that it's shorter than Lent, that it doesn't have the penitential spirit of Lent, that it seems to be conducive to longer nights, colder days, and um, it just, to me, I find uh, is a gift from God, the, the, just the season, which allows us to more profoundly, and I believe um, deeply enter into uh, the experience of preparing for the birth of our Savior, the Prince of Peace. We have four weeks of Advent, and um, in light of that, I'd like to give four really brief topics. The first is on hope. The second is the gift of faith. The third is listening to God. And then the fourth is the role of Mary as model disciple. There are many opportunities, I think, for um, quiet prayer during this time. And some of you may use um, prayer booklets. Um, the blue book here that is, um, comes from uh, Michigan is just a very effective way. We also have, of course, uh, the Magnificat. Um, that offers reflections in light of the readings. There's other uh, prayer books that um, <clears throat> are um, 
you know, published, and then one can look at them uh, when the season is over. One can go back to it next year. So whether they're the ones that are printed for the year or ones that are books that are published, uh, I think it's important for this Advent time as we're getting ready for Christmas, but yes, that we take this thing to, to just be quiet with the Lord. And um, remember, Lent has the prayer, penance, and almsgiving as crucial elements of our preparation for Easter. But Advent is more focused. It's really about the time and quiet prayer. So again, the first reflection on hope. If you listen to the readings at Mass, um, the prophet Isaiah is the book that is read in the first readings at Mass. And Isaiah, if you remember, recall from readings earlier this week, gives a picture when all nations are at peace. That's the image of the, the cobra and the lamb and the ox and the lion. It is often depicted on Christmas cards, but it is a reminder that um, the gift of hope comes from the desire that God has for all of us that we um, be at peace and that we have in our lives um, a calm and it is about hope. Uh, I often speak about we live at times that are difficult to hope. We live in a fractured world, a divided church, and a troubled America. And it's because that we live in an imperfect world and a world that seems at times increasingly divided that we need hope. Now, some people refuse to have hope. And they're, they're cynics, and it's easy to be a cynic. Um, there's no trust. There's no effort. There's no love. In dioceses that have been bankrupt, and at the bishops conference, we heard some bishops speak about the experience in uh, Spokane was one of them. When I came to the diocese, we had already been six years in bankruptcy, and the first two years of my eight um, were dealing with that. And I noticed at times, and it's common to hear this of other bishops when dioceses are in bankruptcy, there can be really three responses. There can become amongst the priests, I suppose, the pastors, a certain cynicism. Um, it, you know, is it going to get better? Why should we put forth any effort? This is a troubled time. There are those who become paralyzed by it, and uh, others become almost um, lone rangers in themselves. All of that, when facing the difficulties of life, those are all expressions that lack hope. Now, hope is different from optimism. Optimism is wishful thinking, and many times it's um, out of touch with what really is. Hope, on the other hand, is reality grounded in faith. When Jesus says, know that I'm with you to the end of the age, those words he spoke uh, before he ascended to heaven, that's the basis of why we can say that hope is reality grounded in faith. God is with us, and no matter how difficult the times are and the circumstances, he calls us to trust that he is with us. And I think, and again, the four weeks of Advent, as we listen on tomorrow's reading, which will be the second uh, Sunday of Advent, Listen uh, in your heart and see where you might find those messages of hope, especially listening on the daily mass readings from Isaiah. When we hope, we can trust and we don't sit back. Um, we're spurred to action and our efforts matter. The task, and I think this is very important for you as Sarans, is your continued commitment of prayer, of encouragement, of support. First, your own prayer life, but also the deep and I think profound respect you have for the concept of vocation, that God will call young men and women to priesthood and to consecrated life to serve you, his holy people. So I often say this, that our efforts are our own. The results are always up to the Lord. It is only God who can fulfill our hope, and he has given us his word. And that is enough. So again, in your preparations for Christmas, in your time during the season of Advent, just look and listen to the readings, look in scripture, read in scriptures, um, find ways in your own life uh, to really live in a spirit of hope, not optimism, but hope, and pray for a greater sense of trust. So hope is a central uh, theme of the season of Advent. Also, a second theme is, of course, the gift of faith. When I uh, go to confession, remember, 
as bishops, uh, we don't, and priests don't forgive ourselves. We have to go to confession. But the priest I, uh, is a very wise priest that I go to. And often when he concludes after the prayer of absolution, he always concludes, keep the faith. And I think when I, last night I was telling before we began, I got together with um, 14 graduates of a class of 98 from Marin Catholic, where I was their teacher and have done most of their weddings, baptized their kids. We get together, we've gotten together uh, before Christmas for the last 20 years. And um, I always talk about keep the faith and the faith will keep you. When in scripture, especially um, Jesus, and we'll hear this reading, talks about he's talking to the father and he says you know thank you i bless you father for you basically have kept from the learned and the clever what you've given to the mere children that is those who have a trusting faith and this reminds us that god doesn't hide truth now too often people who are bright um maybe even greatly educated if they lack humility they are not wise they are in fact arrogant and when Jesus says, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, that's just a reminder to us for our faith. Our faith cannot grow if we are not humble. And we are, should be, and this is the great blessing of the church, no one run, runs or directs, no institution, human or divine, runs the single largest education system in the world than the Catholic Church, from preschool to medical school. So no one could ever accuse the church of being anti-intellectual. One of the challenges in my capacity as chair of Catholic education is we are, I believe, we need to refound our Catholic schools. And too often our schools become public schools with religious scaffolding around them. But we have a pursuit of truth that is part of our mission. We've done that from the very beginning, the earliest of the cathedral schools or monastery schools, the convent schools for girls. But I say this, that the intellectual approach to faith can only do so much. Ultimate truth um, does not come from mere human reason. It comes from divine illumination. That is the Holy Spirit. And so faith and reason work together. Uh, there's this movement afoot that young people are leaving the faith because they don't believe science has any place with faith. And in fact, they do. Again, the largest school system, medical schools, you can't be anti-science. We hear this phrase, follow the science. And we know that in the secular world, it's conveniently followed. The craziness of this whole gender issue, uh, wokeism and other issues do not follow. How can we, again, say that the unborn child from the earliest of conception is not a life? So. I say all of that, that Jesus is not, when he's speaking of those words, uh, what God has revealed to the merest ones, that is the children, he's meaning those who have a trusting faith, even though it's a faith full of questions. So Jesus is not condemning an intellectual approach to faith, but he said it's not enough. You know, too often pride is the obstacle to a deeper faith in God. We have to be very careful that our faith isn't just about what's in the head, but it has to be in our heart. I often say to the, to the students when I taught, it's not just knowing about God, it's knowing God. And St. Teresa, the little flower, had a great line, if God has not your heart, he has nothing. And what is in our heart will give life or death to the soul. So when we're in these, these four weeks of Advent, you know, listen to the to the readings and, and pray over them, especially, again, the prophet Isaiah and then the words of Jesus and um, pray that this four weeks will bring you that grace to strengthen your faith. Always asking questions, the Eucharistic prayer, the fourth one, which we will not hear during um, Advent because it is um, you can't separate the preface from the body of the Eucharistic prayer. But there is a line. And you can read in the Missalette, all who seek you with a sincere heart and all those whose faith to, is known to you alone. So when we're asking for a deeper faith and as Sarans, you know, your commitment to mass, to your own prayer life. And I really appreciate the emphasis it's, it, with Sarah over these past few years has been developing a faith life as individuals, which allows you a strength, then allows you to, to, to give, to give of yourself, to give to the work of Sarah, to your parish. So. The, the third, listening um, to God. Um, 
that's a crucial aspect of one's faith. Um, if you think about that, do we really listen to God? Do we listen to God in the silence of our hearts where God speaks loudest? Uh, what is a kind of a theme of Trappist, the Trappist monks, is God speaks loudest in the, the quiet of our heart. Um, how often have we heard that phrase? You probably as parents maybe said it to your children or your parents said it to you when you're growing up. If only you'd listened to me, this would never have happened. And I think that's probably, if, again, the prophet Isaiah is putting those words in God's mouth when he's frustrated with his people, the chosen people. And what do they do? They didn't listen to him. And then, of course, the kingdom collapsed. Jerusalem was destroyed. The children were put into exile. And it is Jesus who is the long for Savior, the Messiah. Um, but in the, one of the passages that you're going to hear during this season of Advent, Jesus is very frustrated. Remember, he says, essentially, you know, we, we played you a, a song you did not dance. We sang you a dirge you did not weep. And um, he's talking about the, the people, of, of the Jewish people. They weren't happy with John. They complained about John, that he was odd. Uh, and John was separate from the people. He preached, as we're going to hear this, this week on the second Sunday, he preached that message. And it was, John is described as, you know, living on locusts and honey. And that's a great image. If you listen to those words, you know, for the people of Africa, locusts represents destruction. Locusts come in and they eat everything, the crops and destroy it. But honey is seen as, you know, a land flowing of milk and honey. Those are great images of, um, and Jesus is saying, look, you, got, you didn't like what John said. You didn't like what I said. John separated from the people, Jesus with the people, you know, going to the wedding reception. Uh, being with them, eating with them. But those images, again, what do people want? Life is about locusts, which at times is difficulty, and it's about honey, which is great blessings. <clears throat> we can't escape that. Um, but again, in that theme, we're listening. What in our lives uh, do we expect of God? What do we want of God? Um, you know, it's been said that controversy always dredges up the highest virtue and the lowest vice. And we see that even in, in, in the church. Um, but when we listen to God, we do so big freely, you know, God, uh, does not force us to, to believe in him by any means. It's all a gift and faith, uh, calls us to that. And, um, I just keep that in mind that, uh, I know that times parents, one of the greatest, uh, prayers of, of it probably weighs heavily on the hearts of, of many Catholic parents is, when their children or grandchildren do not practice their faith. And um, they may have gone to Catholic schools. They may have been always at mass. They've been a great witness and example by parents. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the response to God is always free. He respects our freedom too much. And um, he won't force people to believe in him. But the way I think our belief can be strengthened, if we do in fact listen, and we ask ourselves, who are we? Are we people that we never think that God does what we ask of him? Um, but our freedom is sacred to God. We are the only creatures that can say no to God, and we're the only creatures who can say yes to God. So again, in those readings that you will hear in these four weeks of Advent, in your heart and in your mind, and, and uh, listen to the words that uh, the prophet speaks and listen to Jesus's words or John's words, uh, calling people to listen to God. So it's twofold. You listen to the scriptures and you read the scriptures, you pray the scriptures and see the theme of listen. So that's a third kind of theme that permeates the four weeks of Advent. And of course, then I want to conclude with in the fourth week is um, the role of our blessed mother. And, um, I'm blessed in, in the Diocese of Spokane that we are under the patronage of Our Lady of Lourdes. Our Lady of Lourdes, as the French say, uh, the only cathedral, the only diocese in all of North America, not just the United States, all of North America, entrusted to, to Our Lady. When we heard the words of the Annunciation, again, they, they will come at the end of, of uh, right before Christmas. Um, it's that same method of Zachariah, uh, John's father. Uh, where the Holy Spirit comes and announces through the angel. And, um, of course, 
the differences between Zechariah and Mary is Zechariah um, had always prayed. They had prayed for a child. Um, Mary's uh, message from the angel is an initiative taken by God. God is initiating. So Mary asks all sorts of questions because someone, I mean, the students used to say to me, why does Mary get to ask questions? Zachariah asks one question and he struck mute. <laughs> and um, it's because, you know, John was conceived in the normal way. And um, of course, Mary is, you know, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. So Mary reminds us that um, faith is not blind. It's beyond reason, but it's not against reason. That's a crucial thing. Faith is beyond reason, but it is not against it. And we should ask questions. Um, one of the studies was saying why young people leave the faith. And two things were crucial in this study now about eight years ago, done by at St. Mary's in Winona, the Christian Brothers College in Minnesota. It said that um, young people did not have an adult in their life who modeled for them faith, who could help them question and answer questions, nor did they have a peer that they saw living the faith. And I know, again, teaching school, that dinner I had last night, there are a couple individuals in that class who were just leaders, and they, they believed. They didn't believe without struggle, but they believed. And I think their peers, their classmates saw in that. And um, so again, Mary has for us this ability to to ask questions, which we should, but Mary also is able to say yes. And she did not know that that first yes uh, would lead to a whole different life. But probably scripture scholars say this and theologians, that Mary's big yes to be the mother of our Lord would have followed many small yeses along the way because she was raised in a very faithful Jewish home. And a reminder to us that that small yeses allow us to say the big yeses to God. I know myself, I've told that story about when someone said, when did you first think, you know, where's your vocation come from? And I always say, looking back when I became vocation director, which is when I first, you know, worked with Sarah, um, we were going into the eighth grade and we were in my parish, or Lady of the Visitation, before we moved my family to St. Brennan's. And the priest, Father Mike Burns, who passed away two summers ago, uh, said to a buddy of mine, Bob Cinti, hey, we're going to move the mass, the weekday mass. The, this is a summer now. Imagine two altar boys, 8 a.m. mass and 5 p.m. mass in the summer. Some parishes, you can't even get kids to serve on the Sundays. But he said, we're going to move to the convent, which was the Daughters of Charity convent chapel. Only one of you is needed to serve. And for some reason, I said yes. Now, I remember that's significant because when we were growing up, my cousins lived two blocks away. And there were five of them, five boys and a girl in my family, three girls, four boys. And my brother and I served and my cousins all served, but we never wanted to be committed to the summer. And, and our, both our moms, my mom and her twin said, wait a minute, you go on vacation in June, you go on vacation in August, um, you serve when you are needed and except for those two weeks. So we try to get out of serve. We always went to mass, but we try to get out. Well, this time that small yes, Looking back, I would enter the seminary, um, oh, you know, uh, eight years later and nine years later. And I think that small yes I said to serve mass led to me to, to say yes to enter the seminary. And the other yes is to be a priest, yes to be a bishop. So Mary reminds us of that. And each one of us, I'm sure you said this in your marriages, um, in your jobs, you say yes, you don't quite know exactly where it's going to lead you, and you continue to say yes along the way. And that's what discipleship is about. It's not one and that's it. We say yes on and on. And Mary is a very good example for us, and she helps us. And we should pray, especially in the season of Advent, um, to have Mary in our lives, to intercede for us. And I often, every day I pray for uh, the vocations just in my diocese of Spokane for these young men, that Mary will help them listen to her son, that Mary will help them trust as she did, and that Mary that will pray and help them pray as she did, be it done to me according to thy word. Um, I think it's just so important for us to know that um, 
Mary uh, did not step back blindly, but she did. She, she pondered these things, which we should, and she asked questions. And so for us, I just um, really would um, encourage you to ask in the season of Advent, as we prepare for Christmas, our Blessed Mother to intercede uh, in your life, that of your family, in the work of Sarah, and in our church, especially this time when there's so much confusion. And um, there seems to be a lot of people who are distracted, discouraged, um, even, even divided. So we ask Mary to be with us, knowing that God's will is not always easy, but it is what gives us the peace. And that peace is so important for us. When we say yes to the Lord, um, our lives will be blessed and they will bear fruit. And it does require trust. So again, four themes to keep in mind uh, just in, in these days is the importance of hope, that of faith, that of listening to God and asking our Blessed Mother's intercession. So those are some neat thoughts I have for our four weeks of Advent. And I don't know if this is the time for question, but please let me know. Yeah, that's really terrific. I, there's a lot of meat there for all of us to think about. You know, if I, uh, I'm going to jump the line here and just make some comments. Your your comment about hope. Um, there's a there is a lot of dissension in the church right now, and uh, I just became a Twitter X member, and boy, there's a lot of controversy on there about the things that are happening in the United States. But I came across a a little video by a priest who was an exorcist in the church. And mm -hmm. his comment was, it really helped me. He said, uh, he said, all this dissension and division, he says, this is exactly what the devil wants. He says, but we have this great advantage. He says, we know how the book ends. Yeah. We know Jesus wins. We know the church withstands the gates of the netherworld. And he said, that's all you really have to know. And uh, just just uh, stick with the church, and you'll be okay. The, yeah. The other good. comment. Yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. yeah. The other comment is on listening to God, and I have a a priest who's a very good friend, and I told him once I was heading off to Eucharistic adoration, and he says, "Well, be sure you shut up half the time." <laughs> I said, "What What do you mean by that?" He says, "Well, it's supposed to be a conversation between you and God," and he said, "If you do all the talking, you won't you won't hear what he's trying to say." So. That's always been good advice to me, and I I always found Eucharistic adoration to be the uh, that quiet time, and it's it's hard to make your mind quiet. It, it just, is just That's back why off. Sometimes yeah. in, in adoration, um, there's constant singing, and even we, we we I've seen this in diocesan gatherings. Even there's constant singing, and adoration should really have maybe, and you do it. In, in ways to um, people get used to it, but uh, there needs to be a block of time that is just quiet, not even even the background music. It just needs to be sitting quietly with the Lord. And I know that when I've gone on the pilgrimages to Lourdes, um, where uh, young men possibly called the priest to go with us, they we always have time for adoration. And um, I believe that young people are really drawn to adoration because it is that rare moment in their life when they, they are not distracted. And um, they may be distracted in their mind, but they're sitting. And I believe God gives them a grace because he, you know, God wants us to put forth effort. And the effort that he, we put forth, especially young people to get away from social media, to get away from technology and just sit with the Lord, the grace that they receive. That's why any older Catholic who discourages or doesn't believe in adoration uh, adoration leads people to the to the mass and uh it is so important but one has to be quiet one has to you know as, as saint catherine Labore has this great quote i go to the chapel i sit and i wait for god to give and sometimes he gives me something sometimes he doesn't but god will always he's god will always speak to you when you go to him quietly and simply so. <laughs> great comment um I have some uh, comments and questions that are kind of sure. mixed here. Bob Labatt from uh, Minnesota just wanted to say it's an outstanding message. Message: Trust in faith is good. Peace and prayers, Bishop. Thank you. Uh, Gino Damadia 
says, uh, faith and reason. Could you speak about times when a person experiences a crisis and they ask God why? Yeah. Uh, when, when people um, struggle in their faith, and sometimes it's the human side of the church, which can be very discouraging because the devil discourages, distracts, divides, um, deceives, um, and will destroy if, if not stopped. And um, so when, when people have a crisis and they ask God why, sometimes we won't know, but we're never alone in that difficulty because some of the greatest saints, as we know, whether the most recent Mother Teresa, you know, she would write those things uh, for great difficulty, asking God why, repeatedly why, but she persevered. And you remember that she wrote those letters and she was hoping her spiritual director would destroy him, but he felt that they would have something to offer the people who also struggled. So we may not know why, but sometimes we do, but we are never alone in that period of time. And, um, I know I was talking to a priest friend of mine and I said, aren't you overwhelmed by God's love? And he said, no, I'm not there yet. And to me, I, I maybe I've been very blessed by this, but you know, I think God's, um, love and his presence is always there even when we don't feel like that so a crisis of faith and asking god um that's common to the path of holiness but in the midst of it what is essential during those times um is to remain faithful to bring this crisis in our prayer said lord why is this happening and we should ask we may not have it revealed sometimes it's only afterwards that we say there the hand of god was there in that life so that's at least from my own experience bishop we have a request here uh by robert heacock he's asking could you review again the comments from mother Teresa about the heart and the soul <clears throat> uh, no saint it was um saint therese the little flower who said okay if god has not your heart he has nothing uh, that was from the little flower. My comment that I uh, um, is what is in the heart will give life or death to the soul. So if one's heart is full of revenge and anger, that eventually dries the soul. But if one's heart is merciful and, and trusting, then um, and asks always to be poured in with God's love, um, then that the soul grows in the sense of in our path to holiness so again the little flower if god has not your heart he has nothing so and then you know what goes what is in our heart i, I love in, in the gospels you know when we when we say normally thinking it's the mind but there's one of that knowing what they were thinking in their hearts that's what that's what um jesus often you know he's talking about the like the uh the um pharisees yeah Pharisees, yeah. And he's at the home, knowing what they were thinking in their hearts. And that's exactly true. Because, you know, what is in our heart? You know, that's where our treasure is. Great. Um, I have uh, two two questions from uh, or comments from well, Cindy Omlin has asked, could you update us on the activities and direction of the USCCB Education Committee? Yeah, essentially, um, as I said, I'm in beginning my third of my my um, three year term, and I my successor is Father, uh, Bishop David O'Connell, who's a Vincentian, who's the Bishop of Trent, New Jersey. He was the president of Catholic University, uh, who really made great efforts to put the university back on track. But my in the role of chair of it, what we've been working with, Mary Pat Donahue is the uh, executive director of the Secretariat. I'm chair of the Bishops Committee, so. On one level, I guess I'm, I'm her boss, so we work very closely together. And some of the things we've been um, talking about is refounding our Catholic schools, especially the K through 12, uh, with, a, with a more liberal arts model and pursuit of truth. Um, and we're finding that, um, as I said, spiritually, academically, religiously mediocre schools are not going to last. And we have to have schools that um, are very strong in their foundation. And um, that's one of our priorities. We're also looking at um, school choice for parents. 
Now, there's been some setbacks, but there's also been some successes. Nebraska, which uh, Archbishop Lucas in Omaha was talking about, they were surprised, but giving school choice allows parents. And I think what happened during the pa pandemic was parents saw what was really going on in some of these, Catholic, these public school systems. And the whole con this gender stuff and the wokeism and all that, we need Catholic schools that are solid and we have a tradition of excellence. We just have to make sure that they are Catholic schools and not just private schools or enough trapping. And sometimes, sadly, you have schools that once were staffed by religious orders that can be problematic. You might accuse sometimes diocesan and parish models of being spiritually mediocre, but I look at curriculum from some religious order schools and I'm appalled. You know, you're not going to Catholic schools to become activists. You're meant to be ultimately, uh, um, your goal is the salvation of souls and to help the salvation of souls of others. And uh, that's what Catholic schools, you can do, be both solid Catholically, faithful to the church, what it believes and teaches, and be academically and extracurricular. They're not opposed to one another. But we have to also make sure we have leaders. And in the end, I'm convinced of this, the leader has to be a person of great faith to guide the school. And um, it's like religious orders and vocations. Only those that are solid have vocations. The rest are going the way of you know, the phone book. So um, anyway, that's some of my thoughts uh, about what we're doing in Catholic education. Thank you. We've got a lot of comments here, but I'm going to read one last question. We've only got yeah. time for one more. This is from Jan Landers. And she, she asks, how has Mary directly helped you in your vocation? That's a great question. Um, I look back and um, I think Mary um, always points me to her son. And um, I think it is Mary who, um, I think both when I was a boy growing up, we had, my family was very uh, close and as close to the Daughters of Charity. So the Miraculous Medal, St. Catherine Labore. And um, whenever I go there, um, I'm just always, whether in Lourdes also or Fatima, how Mary um, chooses at times the most unlikely people um, to do God's work. And I think I oftentimes I think of, you know, I wish I had this skill. I think it could be a better bishop at that. And I think Mary just reminds, no, let what you have be developed and trust and let Christ guide you because it's about God. And I, so I think for me, it's, it's just Mary's um, pointing to the fact to her son, to trust her son, to um, live with questions, to ponder, um, and I think that's why the, 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 the older I get and, uh, you know, the more I, I just think of Mary's role at the wedding feast at Cana. You would think the first miracle Jesus would, would have done work would have been the coming of a storm, the raising of the dead, the curing. But it was at the request of his mother to save a couple from embarrassment at a reception. So there's something very human about that. But I think Mary just, for me, um, I just feel like when you go to Lourdes, it's just, uh, it's a place of healing. And I think Mary, you know, crushing the head of the serpent and Mary holding the globe, which she said, this is everybody in the world, especially the people of France, but everybody. And it just reminds me of the universal mission of the church and that um, Mary offers so much. Now, just, just some thoughts. Yeah. I need to cut it off here. So Bishop Daly, let me tell you, thanks again for sharing your time and your thoughts yeah. with us today. Okay. And I want you to know that you do so much for Sarah and you are deeply appreciated by all of us. Thank you. Thank we are blessed. Thank you very much. Well, have a blessed uh, rest of the Advent and the Christmas. I look forward to, uh, I am I think I'm do doing stuff. We're some gathering of Sarah in the new year. So yeah, you're going to be a, pre a main presenter at the rally down in Miami in January. That's right. Yep. Good. All right. Thank you. Well, God Thank bless. you for that, too. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We'll see you then. Okay. Bye-bye. Just a reminder, again, for those of you listening, that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the Sarah YouTube channel. For the business portion of our meeting today, Judy Shoemaker, president of the Sarah International Foundation, will be sharing some more on the great work that the foundation is doing for vocations in the worldwide Catholic Church 
and our annual fundraising appeal. Judy, you want to take it from there? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me again today. Wow, that was so great from Bishop Daly. My, my mind is still like elevated and just, you know, pondering the beautiful message. It just, we're so fortunate to have him. And you gave me the idea that this would make a great club presentation. Uh, all all club members should should be hearing from Bishop Daly and and be inspired by his words. So anyway, well, you know, this is a great time of the year for the foundation. This is my favorite time of the year, um, you know, Christmas season, Advent season. But also in the month of December, the foundation gives away money. We give away our grants at our board meeting in December. We just had our meeting last weekend in Chicago. And uh, leading up to that, we worked in teams of two, and we were each given about 12 or so grants to review, uh, so that when we came into the board meeting, we had already done fleshed out, you know, what people were asking for, and we would be prepared to present the case. Um, just a word about the screening process, we have to be uh, very careful and respectful about each one of the grants. Uh, the first thing that we look for is a letter from the bishop. So we need to make sure that whoever is asking for money is a real, uh, you know, a real religious order or a house of formation uh, and that the bishop endorses this project. So we look to make sure that they have the support of the bishop. We also look to see, have they thought it out? Do they have a budget that looks realistic? It looks doable. And do they have a plan to implement their program or whatever it is they're asking for so that we know they've thought it through, they're, they're going to go through with this if they have the money to do it. And the final thing we look at, and probably the most important thing is, does this project have a, a, an impact on vocations? So we don't typically support... Um, things like uh, helping to keep the lights on and you know building wells and things like that although we have done some of that because in some countries it's such a dire need that they're you know it, it's part of their you know being able to go forward but we do look at, and make sure that this has a very strong impact on vocations so uh, I just wanted to give you sort of a, a, a sampling or an accounting of what we decided this past weekend. So we had 18 applications from the United States, and we were able to make 12 awards of those 18. We had a huge increase in the number of applicants from Africa, where we received 36 applications, and we were able to award seven of those. We had 12 applicants from India, which is also very high. I've seen that number increase a little bit each year. Tremendous basic, basic needs. And we awarded five of those from India. We had one applicant each from Vietnam, Indonesia, and Brazil, South America, and we granted each one of those their award. We had two applicants from Mexico, and we were able to award one of those. In all, there were 29 awards. We also received applications, but did not make awards this year from Italy, Papua New Guinea, Spain, Germany, Haiti, and Colombia. Uh, one award that was given out of cycle or decided out of our grant cycle was the uh, award to uh, help with the sponsorship of the Eucharistic Congress this coming year. So total of grants that we awarded this year were $83,000. And of course, um, you know, most of the grants are small just because of our budget. We'd like to be able to do more. And so we're trying each year to raise more and more money so that we have more money to award. Uh, but we do give major grants to the North American College in Rome where seminarians from North America attend for their formation. And we typically support the Institute of Priestly Formation where seminarians get um, enrichment, you know, summer programs for enrichment on the priesthood and prayer life. So anyway, we're, we're trying to increase our funds so that we can do more, but we're very happy with what we're able to do this year. So next up, I will be taking these uh, grants to the Sarah International Board in January in Miami 
so that I can present them. Uh, the board members can review them and discuss, ask questions if they have any questions. And the Sarah International Board will give their final approval on these grants. And then following that meeting, we will be announcing their, uh, to the grant recipients their awards. So we look forward to sharing these vocation stories with Sarans in the coming year uh, by featuring these recipients uh, in part through this, this uh, Sarah Meets and in the Always Forward newsletter and in the Sarah Magazine so that you all can have a greater sense of an understanding of what is the foundation and what is the impact that your gifts are making on vocations. Uh, this year, we also awarded the first Always Forward award and um, I, I can't announce it just yet. We'll be announcing it next year, but this is a new fund that we started to help uh, you know, people understand, great, have a greater understanding of St. Unipero Sarah and the work of the Sarah organization uh, by highlighting a certain uh, project that we felt was the most, most worthy of the, of the Always Forward Award and uh, doing uh, specific publicity with this, not only in the diocese where that project is funded, but uh, also in national Catholic media. So we wanna make a big deal out of it. Um, so I guess in closing, I just wanted to let you know that if you haven't received a solicitation from the foundation, you will. The mailing went out on Monday of this week, and uh, so you'll be getting it in the next few days if you don't already have it. And so we just ask on behalf of the board that you open that letter and read it, just reflect on the messages therein and think about the impact that your gift could make if you make a consider a gift uh, by year end. So thank you for this and uh, appreciate being able to share this news with you. That was a great presentation, Judy, and thank you to you and to all the members of the Sarah International Foundation Board. I think there's a lot more work there than people realize that goes into making good selections on the grants, and uh, you're just doing great. And I and I just want to encourage again uh, our U.S. Sarans, especially, you know, so so much of what we do is focused in our clubs or in our diocese and sometimes in our country, but this is a it's just a, such an easy, convenient way with just a small gift uh, to make a big difference in promoting the Sarah mission in the worldwide Catholic Church. And the worldwide Catholic Church is is out part of our, that is our mission. It's not just the mission here in the U.S. It's not just the mission in our diocese. It's not just the mission in our club. So um, I hope everybody does consider making some gift, no matter how small it is, uh, I think we'd make just a tremendous difference in terms of what we can do for vocations worldwide. Thanks again, Judy, and thank you to your Sarah Foundation Board. Thank you. Uh, before closing our closing prayer, I want to ask Greg Schweitz to give us a preview of the upcoming speaker lineup for Sarah Meets, and it looks terrific. Greg, do you want to take a few minutes there? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Man, what a great presentation by Bishop Daly today. And so I want to remind people that these uh, recordings or these presentations are recorded. They're they're put up on our YouTube channel, and as was suggested uh, by one of the comments and the questions that that came that were presented to him, this would be a great topic that could be used at a club meeting or distributed amongst our club members. And so we have a small percentage of our members are able to listen in on a regular basis in person, but these are, are always uh, opportunities to relearn it, hear it again, present it to new people that weren't able to attend. So I wanna encourage the use of any of these Sarah Meets programs at the local club level in some manner. Uh, so thank you for that and God bless Bishop Daly for his presentation. Uh, we have a, a great lineup uh, for the rest uh, or into the into the new new year. Uh, heading off uh, in in January, we're going to have Bishop Andrew Cousins will be our speaker. And those of you who are familiar with him, uh, two notable accomplishments. Third one, he didn't accomplish it. He just is it. He's the the son of our own uh, Judy Cousins, and so it's just great, uh, amazing family there. Secondly, uh, he used to be our, has been our past Episcopal moderator for the USA Council, 
knows Sarah very well. And then lastly, he's in the chair of the National Eucharistic Congress and the whole revival project, the three-year project that the bishops have just have moved forward on, of which we'll be part of. So his uh, presentation in January, the second Saturday, like always, every month, second Saturday, uh, will be on Eucharistic Congress. But I think it's going to be more of a reflection on the Eucharist and the real presence. And I think it'll be a good, another great uh, uh, opportunity to reflect on one of the great sacraments and uh, really the defining, one of the defining attributes of being a Catholic. So really grateful for him uh, saying yes to that and it'll be great. So then February, March and April are all locked up. And so Kathleen uh, Beckman book, uh, Praying for Priests, uh, She's big on the Eucharist, too. She'll be an uh, author and speaking on that. March is our own Cardinal Collins. Uh, we'll be doing our Lenten reflection, not only on the Ceremies, but also throughout the week of, of, of Lent. We'll be outstanding to listen to his weekly reflections. And then in April, we have notable author Scott Hahn will be uh, our speaker. And so we'll have a great presentation from him on vocations. So uh, we got a big rollout and big lineup, rather, uh, of great speakers. And it's great to be part of the Sarah Meets. And thanks to Jerry Bees, uh, who is uh, my partner and has done a lot of the legwork on these, uh, getting these contact contacts and uh, roping in these pe good people. So it'll be to our benefit, I can assure you. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Greg. And thanks to your great committee for that lines up all these speakers for us. Let's finish with our closing prayer. I'm going to ask Steve Dominey, our new district governor-elect for the Spokane, Washington area, to lead us. Steve? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Prayer for the perseverance of vocations. Oh God, you have constituted your only begotten Son, supreme and eternal priest, for the glory of of your majesty and the salvation of mankind. Grant that those whom he has chosen ministers and dispensers of his mysteries may be found faithful in fulfilling the ministry they have received. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for stepping up to serve as a future district governor there. That concludes our meeting for this month. Thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you for all you do. Spread the word and work of Sarah. Be safe. Pray hard. God bless. God bless.